All right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome. It is such a pleasure to have you all joining. My name is Dr. Sheza Khan. I'm the executive director of the Islamic Schools League of America. We're here gathered to talk about um, reopening our Islamic schools safely, inshallah. I know that many of us have started Islamic school, uh, schools have already reopened. You might be one week or two weeks in. We're so excited to have you join us and reevaluate or just consider the safety protocols that you already have and look at that. And many of you, as Brother Nazir has just said, are will be starting in another week or two, inshallah. We're really happy, no matter if you've already started or if you're about to start, we're happy to have you here and have our panel of medical and health experts, inshallah, provide some guidance and information to you that will be beneficial. So just by some way of protocol, um, today's meeting is going to be a little different than our typical kind of casual back and forth, we unmute and, and all of that typically throughout our meetings. Today, what we'll do just to be able um, to get through in a timely fashion, we do have a hard stop at the top of the hour, inshallah. We're going to give each of our panelists about five to 10 minutes each to speak. Um, if you have questions as they're speaking, we invite you to use the chat box and message to everyone or to me directly your questions. And we will then go through, I will be reading and moderating as um, we are going through today's meeting. And I will then share some of those questions with the panelists, inshallah, during our Q&A. Um, we should have about 30 minutes, inshallah, for the question and answer. We will uh, ask you to please ensure that your questions are related to medical and health related questions, uh, not legal questions. For example, can I have all of my staff take a vaccine? This is not a legal panel, so that might be out of the purview and expertise of our panelists. However, any questions that you have related to, um, to, to health and, and medicine would absolutely be relevant. One of the things that ISLA has been doing throughout COVID-19, in addition to some of the other um, initiatives that you have been part of, alhamdulillah, we've done some online professional development, we've done um, teach with tech webinars, admin meetings. Um, but one of the things that's been kind of behind the scenes is that we joined a, um, a, the National Muslim Coalition on COVID-19. Shafiq can uh, correct me, I know that I butchered that. The National COVID-19 Muslim Coalition, which is, yeah, Shafiq, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, it's the National Muslim COVID Task Force. <laughs> Thank you, I really butchered that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So we've been part of that. We've been joining uh, weekly, bi-weekly meetings with the task force, asking questions about um, reopening our schools safely and engaging in different work. We have some exciting news to share with you later on, inshallah, about that. But I don't want to take any more time from my panelists. One of the ways in which we got connected with these wonderful panelists is that um, the folks joining us today are also part of this task force, um, members of the task force, members of committees or organizations that are part of the task force as well. We want to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Noor Jihan Abdul Haq. Dr. Noor Jihan Abdul Haq is a pediatric specialist in Dell City, Oklahoma. She has her own practice called Peace of Mind Pediatrics in Oklahoma City. She has over 13 years of experience in the medical field. She graduated from Morehouse School of Medicine Medical School in 2008 and is affiliated with medical facilities such as Integris Baptist Medical Center, I might be pronouncing that wrong, and Integris Health Edmund. Dr. Abdul Haq is also a member of the National Black Muslim COVID Coalition. I think that's where my mind was kind of going and mixing both of those things together. She's participated in several talks. Um, I recently re-listened to the talk in which she was uh, uh, also joining Dr. Fauci as well a few months ago and um, many others, radio and print appearances discussing COVID-19 and vaccines. And we welcome her to discuss the pediatric side of this, this um, pandemic and addressing what would be pertinent for Islamic school leaders and board members to understand. Thank you for having me. Sister Noor Jihan, you are welcome to share with the with this um, school leaders and and um, audience the pertinent issues, statistics, facts, and figures that you feel would be beneficial for them to know as they reopen their schools or have re already reopened their schools to uh, facilitate face safe 
safe reopenings um, and safety and health of their students and staff? Yes, yes, yes. So um, it's very important that schools understand and, and remember that the, I mean, I know you all are educators, so you realize that it, the, education is super important to children, but what also is important is the social aspect. And so that's where it gets a little bit more difficult when we talk about, um, you know, this virus, because yes, you all easily could educate them virtually. <laughs> I know it wasn't easy at all, but, you know, in terms of the idea or that concept, but we want our children to be able to remain in school. So we're seeing this huge surge of COVID-19 cases with the, throughout the United States. Of course, this, the areas where there are lower vaccination rates, we are seeing higher surges for those of you who are in, you know, the South, your Mississippis, your Alabamas, your Georgia. I'm in Oklahoma. Our vaccination rates are okay, but we are seeing a higher surge than a lot of other states are just because our, um, our governor uh, banned the usage of masks in schools. And I know those in Texas and some of these other Florida, et cetera, you all may be you know, confused as to what you might be able to do. So in terms of our, our children is one thing we have to remember is that we have to protect them at all times. And just like you would want to protect them from fire or from you know, exposures to other things within your school, I think that it's important that we take this virus seriously, um, even though you know, some of our you know, elected officials are not. And I just tell people they're not in your classroom, they're not at your school, they're not paying for people's hospital bills, and they're not attending people's funerals, unfortunately. That's the reality of this virus. So it's important that, you know, as an Islamic school, you can put in, you know, strongly encouraging masks, but actually saying we, we, we're going to wear masks. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make sure our teachers, we're going to make sure our staff are wearing them. When we see a child who doesn't have it on, we're going to encourage them to put it on. So yes, we know the statistics. Children are being infected more. And so that's been scaring everyone. But the reality is because this Delta variant is actually more contagious. So it's more similar to chickenpox. And I, I know a lot of you guys probably remember when you know everybody was getting chickenpox at the same time and people were having chickenpox parties. And so the, the alpha variant, which we had earlier, just you know, if you had one person, they might infect two people. But now with this Delta variant, you're infecting three or four because they're actually holding more of the virus in their nose. So they're more contagious. So before children weren't as contagious because the alpha variant and some of the other variants, they just weren't, they didn't have as much. And so, you know, we were like, oh, they're barely even getting it. But now with this new variant, they're actually able to spread it more. And so that's why you're seeing these increased rates of pediat pediatric um, um, cases. And you are seeing more children hospitalized, pediatric, um, excuse me, children hospitalized. And so you have some of these pediatric ICUs that have been given reports. A lot of those children who are at higher risk to have more severe COVID, it's similar to adults, are children who are obese and overweight, but also are children with other illnesses. And we often forget about our asthmatics, our children with sickle cell disease, the students with just immune you know, autoimmune deficiencies, our type 1 diabetics, some even type 2 diabetics. So these are children who are already at a discrepancy, and it's important that we protect them as well, because they have a right to an education. And so I, I think that, you know, the news scares a lot of people, and I don't want to, I want it to be more of a, re, re, you know, realistic aspect. Yes, we're seeing more pediatric hospitalizations, but we're not just seeing a surge of you know, children who were otherwise healthy and had, you know, we are seeing, if you look at the stories, you will see that more of the children, unfortunately, who passed away were obese. But that brings me to the other point. Our children have gained 20 to 40 pounds during this pandemic. So now we took the child who wasn't obese and now they are. So, so remember that. So it's important that we're protecting them because we actually have made them more unhealthy because they didn't have any activities. They were stuck in the house. They did virtual learning, which, you know, humbly a lot was the only thing we could do. But when you sit in front of a computer all day, you eat. 
You know, I, 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 I feel like I'm able to go to work each day, but I gained weight as well, just because I wasn't as active as I was before. And so remembering those things. So when you start back to school, also don't forget about PE class and figuring out safe ways to do it before it gets cold, because these kids need to be active. I kind of digress for that. And then the other thing that we're hit with right now and why I still support masks, RSV is coming with a vengeance. And many of you may have, you know, pre-K students, but your high schoolers also can get it. They can also get RSV. If they've already been exposed, they don't have as, you know, their response or their illness isn't as severe. But the reality is they'll just have a cold, but then they can give it to their younger sibling who ends up hospitalized, okay? We, our RSV season this year, it just doesn't make any sense. It normally starts in about October, November and ends in April. This year, I saw my first case at the end of April. We got, we're getting slammed right now with cases of RSV. Our hospitals and ICUs, you keep seeing that they're full. Yes, they're actually full with RSV, rhinovirus, and you have some kids with COVID as well, but you also have kids who have COVID and RSV. And if you're my patient, last week had COVID, RSV, and rhinovirus. Well, SubhanAllah. Dr. abdul Haq, can you take a minute to explain what RSV stands for and, and yes. what that is? <laughs> yes, I apologize. <laughs> Respiratory syncytial virus. It is, it's a virus just like kind of like the common cold, you know, in terms of the symptoms. You get fever, runny nose, cough, congestion. But what happens in the younger children is it really impacts their small little airways that get stuck with all that mucus. And, you know, because they produce tons and tons and tons and tons of mucus. And FYI, it's often clear. I know people always look for colored mucus. I'm like, I haven't seen a kid with RSV and colored mucus. It's always, <laughs> it's always clear. <laughs> and unfortunately, my son, a few years, um, when he was one, after one, he got hospitalized with RSV. It, you know, and so I personally have been that parent in the hospital with a child with RSV. So I understand that. And so masks did help for us not to spread it. But then when we put our guard down, which I understand we were tired of it, that's when we started to see that uptick. So some people are wondering, you know, is it different strains or kind of what's going on with it? And then some just say, maybe we just suppressed it because we were washing our hands. We weren't letting our kids go around touching each other all the time. And now we're back to hugs, we're back to touching, we're back to handshakes and things like that, which changes it. But remember, you know, with this respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, 2 million children a year usually test positive. That's for the ones we actually test. We often don't even test for it because if a sibling has it, we're like, we have it too, right? And so we often don't even test for it. But annually, usually about 58,000 children are hospitalized. So it's 58,000 children hospitalized normally with RSV. So when you're adding that plus the rhinovirus, plus we are having adenovirus outbreaks, which is normal in our summer, which causes fever and sore throat as well. And we also have croup. So I'm seeing a lot of croup. Um, so we're getting the barky coughs, the fever, the runny nose, clear again, <laughs> they've been mostly clear runny noses as well. So we're kind of like getting inundated with several viruses. And so that is why I am a very, very strong advocate for mask wearing, um, no matter your COVID status, because we just really need to protect children period because they haven't been exposed for a year and a half for many of them and so getting back to back to back illnesses could be very detrimental for some of these children so it's very important we pay attention to that and just in terms of how you spread rsv it's what we call droplet so people often talk about with covid it's airborne droplet which one is it you know that was the early discussions and we found out it kind of was both with rsv it surfaces so when you go to that grocery store and you don't wipe down the handle and then you let your kids sit there, yep, that's how they could have got RSV. I kid you not. Like That's so I interesting, Dr. abdul Huck, because, you know, I had kind of laid off of that when I heard that COVID wasn't easily spread through surface contact. And I was like, oh, I don't need to do all that. Very interesting. Yeah, no, I've, I've always wiped it because flu is the same way. Yeah, that's right. Like we, and I get it. I'm probably a germaphobe at some point, but <laughs> it's important that we remember like and because i'm in peds i see the nasty things you guys are teachers <laughs> any of you have younger children you see what they do i mean i know yeah. they put their fingers in their nose all day long and touch stuff and so <laughs> if you see it in your classroom know that that water fountain or that you know pencil sharpener or whatever 
is probably contaminated <laughs> throughout the day. So making sure we're making them wash their hands with soap and water. I know many of you guys probably have them sing songs or do whatever. Remembering hand washing is definitely still going to be key. So if we're washing hands and wearing masks and disinfecting surfaces, we create a much, much safer environment for our children. Of course, spacing is important if you're able to do that, but I also know that some places just really can't do great spacing. So that's when I say be creative with your curriculums and go outside before it gets too cold. Find ways of going outside so that you're not always inside in the same space or even going to, you know, um, you know, if there's a gym or something, you know, a, a larger space for certain things um, that you can have them do. So I did a talk last year, last August, <laughs> about um, can we start school? And it's just interesting because one of the biggest things that I harped on was creating little pods, mm -hmm. right? And these groups don't mix. And when you do that, if there is an outbreak, it's only that one pod that has to quarantine versus the whole school and you having to shut everything down. I see a lot of people rotate teachers and things like that. You just have to be very careful in what you're doing because if that teacher had COVID and you rotated them through five rooms, you just lost five classrooms, mm -hmm. okay? So it's not saying you can't rotate, but it's the question is, is that teacher wearing a mask? Are they wearing a good mask, you know? Or do they have a shield? What, you know, what are we doing if we are having teachers do rotate, if we need to do that? Because I understand the Islamic studies teacher and the Arabic teacher is different than the science. And my, my children attend Islamic school as well. So I, I understand that difficulty, but trying to sit down and figure out what is the safest way to do things is very important. But if you do break kids into little groups, there's a there's an Islamic monastery in Atlanta, and they actually did have some people get COVID, but each pod was separate. So only 10 students were out and the rest of the school was able to continue. So definitely figuring out ways that you can break students up. And I know at recess and things like that, they want to play together, but keeping them in their pod, mm. right? This is your pod. You guys go out for recess. And yes, I know on the weekends, parents might do whatever, but also encouraging the families to social distance. And if they're going to do things, do them outside and to be on board and let them know we don't want to be sick either. Like we're here to educate your children, but inshallah, we don't want to, you know, get any of these illnesses. And we want to make sure that we're present every day to teach every student. So definitely try to get families on board to, you know, buy in because otherwise, you know, they're having birthday parties, yeah. indoor birthday parties at bouncy house places on the weekend. I mean, it was like, well, why did we just separate all of these kids? That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Haq. In the You're interest welcome. of time, um, we'll switch over to um, Dr. Haider, who is joining us as well. I do have some questions that are coming in, so I do want to make sure that we leave time. Uh, and Dr. Abdul Haq has dropped a lot of um, gems for us right now on the mitigation practices that we can continue to engage in, inshallah. I do plan to watch this again and type up some notes for you all so that it can be gathered, or if someone else here is doing that, that'd be wonderful. So we'll go on to our next panelist. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Haq. Dr. Ayaz Haider is an assistant professor at Ohio State University's College of Public Health. During the pandemic, he has worked with State of Ohio to help formulate a response to reopening Ohio after the stay at home order in May, 2020, or maybe that's supposed to say March, 2020. He'll correct me if I'm wrong. And he's provided local data for local decision-making, i.e. changes in learning mode, board approved plans for safe reopening of schools to 21 school districts in central Ohio, including Columbus City Schools. So we welcome Dr. Ayaz, um, Jazakum Lohar for joining us, and I won't take any more time from you. Jazakum Lohar. Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Um, it is truly an honor to be able to serve uh, my community um, in this manner. I never really thought I would be in a position to do something like this. Um, my PhD, coincidentally, was on pandemics and health disparities. And then I moved away, far away from infectious diseases and worked on chronic disease research mainly. But this pandemic hit and, and, and here we are. So uh, uh, I'm just going to add just a little bit because I really want to get to your questions and I don't want to take up more time. Um, 
my work is primarily in collaboration with school districts and local public health departments and coordinating that effort with uh, the CDC guidance and the state health departments. So I think the only point that I would add to the excellent advice that Dr. Abdelhaq gave already is that when it comes to quarantine measures, when it comes to mitigation strategies, mask guidance, when it comes to noting absences and contact tracing within your school building, or if you are a principal with multiple school buildings, let's say you have a high school building and then you have an elementary or middle school building, um, please reach out to your local health department. Whichever health department has jurisdiction over your school district, identify who they are, go to their website. Often they will have algorithms laid out for you about what the guidance is uh, that is being followed by all the other schools, uh, private and public schools within your area. And so what that does is that it, it makes sure that you're following this evidence-based guidance um, from your district uh, and from your local health department. And sometimes that guidance, like in some states, may not be evidence-based, right? Because they're actually going against what the CDC is recommending. And so in those cases, I would suggest that you follow the CDC guidance um, as, much as, uh, as much as possible. Um, and if you are a school that has not typically engaged with your local health department, this is a great time to build that relationship with your health department. Um, if you do not have uh, robust student health facilities like a school nurse, uh, this is a great way to build the case for you know, getting funding in the future to, to do something like that. I know here in Columbus, uh, several children's hospitals have partnered with uh, school uh, buildings in order to provide that student health uh, care. And so this really is an opportunity to collaborate very closely. Um, and I look forward to um, questions that you have um, down the road. So I will, I will pause, stop there and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Feel free guys to um, go ahead and share your questions in the chat here. You can do it as a message to everyone or directly to me and we'll be going through those. We're gonna go to our next panelist. Um, Brother Shafiq Ahmed has over 10 years of experience supporting healthcare data analytics, infectious disease surveillance and managing large scale projects as a subject matter expert. He's a senior management analyst supporting health and human services and has supported the Defense Health Agency, Navy Medicine, and Quantitative and Qualitative Health Research. Brother Shafiq holds an MS in public health focusing on microbiology and emerging infectious diseases. Who knew? <laughs> Go ahead, Brother Shafiq. Yes. So, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, I mean, it's a pleasure to speak to everyone. Um, I want to start kind of from the perspective of you know, everyone who's going to be involved with reopening schools. Um, so that includes, you know, students, staff, and, and teachers. So I, I wanna start with, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu who, you know, very much advocated the importance of staying healthy um, as a well being for our physical health, as well as our spiritual and mental health as well. Um, I think we're, we've heard a lot of our scholars talk about the hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu uh, was asked uh, about a certain situation where there was an outbreak in a certain area. And he, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam provided recommendations for not traveling to that area or if somebody was in that area, not to leave the town that was infected. So I wanna keep that idea uh, while I talk about staying healthy. Um, and that's something that we wanna encourage, you know, teaching, the students uh, about how we can stay uh, stay healthy, you know, while we're at school, while we're outside of school, and that's through you know some of the things that um, Dr. Abdul Haq referred to, as well as Dr. Heidner. So you know the guidance that the CDC provides, as well as state and local jurisdictions that your school may fall into, 
are going to help lay some of that foundations of how do we keep ourselves safe? How do we, you know, open up, reopen our schools safely? So, you know, things like having hand sanitizers, um, you know, now that the price for hand sanitizers have come, have come down dramatically because there's too much of it. So we can utilize that to our advantage, having more in classrooms, you know, encouraging students to wipe down their desks before they move on to their next class. Um, you know, and again, the same idea with wearing masks um, and socially distancing. So I understand there's a, there's a challenge with saying, well, we're gonna have three to six feet distancing in our classrooms with where classrooms might have up to 20 to 30 students. It makes it very, very difficult. That's where our staff staff in school is gonna come into play where we wanna be able to open up our windows to pro, pro, uh, provide proper ventilation or have secondary filtration where having more heavy duty filtrations for proper indoor circulation and things like that. These are just some basic strategies that we can utilize to again, keeping that idea of let's keep everyone safe. You know, We're gonna keep each other safe for the sake of Allah. Um, and do everything we can not to spread this illness. Because we have, you know, as uh, Dr. Abdul Haq mentioned, that we have vulnerable um, populations that go are, are going to be in attending schools. And we wanna make sure that they're safe as well as our school bus drivers who are, you know, bringing children to and from school, our staff member who are gonna be working hard to make sure the schools are running and keeping the schools clean. So. I kind of want to leave it leave it there, and um, again, look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Brother Shafiq. I appreciate that from all of our panelists. Jazakum Allah Khairan. Been taking some notes, and I look forward to sharing those with you all. I'm sure that you all have many questions. We've got a few here, and I'll just start um, asking our panelists this. I will direct the question to one panelist, but feel free, um, others, uh, Brother Shafiq, and others. Um, starting with Sister um, Dr. Abdul Haq, um, you mentioned a good mask. Teachers, are they even wearing a good mask? So one of our um, audience members asked, what is a good mask? So of course the best mask is an N95 mask, um, but we know that that's often can be uncomfortable for some and also difficult to obtain. And so when I say a good mask, we want to use multi-layered masks. Um, two to three layers, preferably three layers. They're now selling those. You want to have a good seal around the nose and this area of the mouth. A lot of times you see, like I can see people's noses and I'm like, well, that means if someone's coughing, then, you know, you're still at risk. So it's important that we have that good seal here. Lots of people make them, you know, so you don't have to go out and spend a ton. I personally am a K- well, I guess I'm blurred, sorry, a KN95 person. So that's what I wear most days. And when it's not as tight on my face, I have a thing to pull it so that it comes tighter on my face. You could actually buy these fairly cheap now. The surgical masks are okay. I'm sure one of the other pants will probably can give us exact statistics on a surgical mask. But remember, if they're straight across here, they're not giving you, they're still a little bit coming out. But of course, we've been using those in surgery for... <laughs> For a really long time um, and not necessarily spreading illness. So there are also clear masks because I know for some of the teachers who have younger students, mm -hmm. they do have some clear masks. I There's some controversy now about one that I always recommended. It was the leaf um, clear mask. It actually can turn into an N95 mask, but then there was some controversy about knockoffs and some other things. So if you do get it, just you can look at that information. I just saw it like two days ago, so I was, I'm not sure what that all is, but that's what I would recommend. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Haq. We have a really specific question here. Um, I'm thinking maybe Dr. Haider, you might be able to respond to this. This is about um, in a, one of the school, one of the school leader schools in their first grade classroom, they're moving back to small teams of four to five desks. So um, previous, you know, in, in education, we like to have those centers, especially in the younger grades. And so during the reopenings after immediately after COVID-19, you had, you saw back that kind of old school style with just the rows. And now they're moving back and they're putting their desks back into groups of four and five in a square because of the classroom size as well. They've removed their desk shields because of the difficulty of teaching and learning. Any guidance, thoughts, or recommendations on that? Oh, you're muted, brother. Sorry, what, what age group? 
first Are grade. So first grade. Six so, seven year olds, six and seven year olds. Yeah. So six to seven year olds, um, the CDC guidance mm -hmm. is that anybody over the age of two should be uh, wearing a mask and certainly offering, you know, mask breaks and whatnot um, for the younger age groups. So I think that um, specifically what you're doing is is um, dependent on your local context. So if your case rates, if you're in a county or an area with high transmission, then you may want to be more careful and do additional layers um, uh, for mitigation, like put the mask, put the shields back on and encourage masks um, among those children. If you're also in an area with low vaccination rate, and we have a sort of a resource list, I think coming out that, uh, Dr. Khan will send out um, where it actually shows you where you can go. Um, and there's the CDC's website where you can actually look at what the vaccination rate and the case rate is in your area. Um, so I think those are the main things I would consider before deciding what level of mitigation strategies you need. Again, there isn't a clear answer, not knowing exactly where you are, but I think that's some general guidance. Um, but let's say you decide, you know, it's too hard to uh, teach without the shields and uh, the, the children can't wear masks because they're just going to refuse to. All right. So then I think the question becomes, what other things can you do? So, for example, can you make sure that those kids are sitting in the same spots on a regular basis? So in the event that public health needs to come in and say, hey, this person is considered a close, expo close exposure and needs to be quarantined, they know exactly which kids to quarantine because they're going to know what their seating chart was and you keep the kids in those, um, uh, in those same seats throughout the school year. And definitely cohorting in such a uh, scenario would also be helpful. So in other words, don't do nothing do something, right? Do something to keep the kids safe because I think that is what we owe to our parents and our staff um, and the teachers um, and, and the community at large as well. And Dr. Heather, I just wanna comment on, uh, you know, the mask wearing. The kids are remarkably good on wearing yes. their masks. And yeah. I find that if everybody's wearing it, then they will wear it. So that's just, but but I like the different scenarios that you've presented so that there isn't the chance for just doing nothing. That's right. really good, thank you. Yes, inshallah, um, alhamdulillah, our panelists have been also working on a resource list and document. And inshallah, we will disseminate that to you along with the recording in uh, this week, inshallah. So that will include some of these resources. We have another question. I think Dr. Heather, can you just confirm, does this, did what you say just address this? The um, on the attendee asks, can you please guide us about what is the percentage of positive case rate increase and uh, the decision making process about if the school should go virtual for the safety of staff and students? Sure. Um, so private schools certainly have that option of being able to, depending on what state you're in, right? So, so you have to kind of check what state you're in and do your laws even allow you to go back to virtual? So in Ohio, for example, we can't go back to virtual or hybrid. It's against the law, right? Um, we, we just can't, we don't have that option anymore. It was taken away from us. Um, so in terms of the percent positivity rate, the CDC is still the best uh, uh, place to look at that information. And what they have is, county level data. So in the resource list that we will send you, I'll make sure to revise it to give you the direct links where you can look at the test positivity rate in your area. Um, the CDC guidance around um, uh, specific uh, test positivity used to be in their decision-making rubric before, but now what they are primarily using is the level of community transmission uh, being low, moderate, substantial, or high. And you can look at that, but also um, uh, vaccination rates um, in your area. And so if the transmission rates are going up, then that is another signal that the test positivity is also going up. And another reason I mentioned that is 
testing is not the same across each of the states. So if all of you are from a specific state and the testing is great, that's great. But if this is across the US and so you need to look at what data are the best and the most reliable according to your local health department. So again, refer back to your local health department your commissioner will tell you, the epidemiologist will tell you in your local health department, what's the test positivity in your area? Is it trending up? Is it trending down? And also consult with other school districts uh, who can also uh, tell you what's going on. Rosh Shafiq, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I also want to put a point in saying that while with the uh, with regards to vaccinations. Now, I know I cannot use this platform to ask people to mandate their staff and teachers to get vaccinated, but I would like to strongly, strongly, strongly encourage staff members and teachers, bus drivers, who will be in contact with um, the students coming in, that it's not too late to go get vaccinated. I would say as, you know, administrators and leaders of your schools to encourage um, people to get vaccinated because the vaccines still do work. Um, while, you know, you may bring up the point, well, we've heard the Delta variant causes breakthrough infections. Yes, that is true, but it reduces severe, the severity of the infection and the effect that it would cause the person who's already been vaccinated. So I would like to strongly encourage um, you to ask your staff staff and teachers to go get vaccinated um, because at the end of the day, we're all in this together. So that transmission can go from child to adult, adult to child, you know, and we want to be able to break the, that, um, that chain of, of transmission as much as we possibly can. So that's just a point I want to make. Thank you so much. We have another question here. Once a child is diagnosed with COVID and a classroom is closed, is 10 days of quarantine for all students and teachers sufficient before reopening? And any that's gonna depend yeah. a lot on siblings. <laughs> like I have twins, right? So, um, so that matters, right? So you have to know exactly who is in the classroom. And that's why, as he just mentioned, that you have to get the health department involved. It's, it's very wise to do that because they're gonna help you pinpoint each person to see exactly how long you should be closed. And then you have to look at outside exposures, right? Because it's supposed to be 10 days after the exposure, but if they went to the you know, playground, you know, cause they were out of school <laughs> and now we have, you know, so it's a lot to it. Um, so I definitely agree with getting the health department involved. And that's why you saw, you know, I'm not sure how many of you all were open, but like my children's school, pretty much went in person the whole year, but then they had a COVID outbreak. And because there was that delay in the 10 days, because people kept getting together, um, we ended up being out for like a month. Um, you know, it had to be virtual for a month because of that. So definitely get others involved to help you with that proper tracing. Cause some people may not be honest with you or be embarrassed. And when you involve the health department, um, they usually are more, I think they're more honest. I don't know, Dr. Hyder, is that, <laughs> are they more honest? They, they are, but, you know, um, as everybody knows, the mistrust of government is the mistrust of government, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have a school where the population is, um, you know, in your view, and, and you all know your school population is the best in the demographics, if you feel like that's an issue, then I think, again, being creative in uh, working with the health departments to get them the information that they need, um, but also balancing that with um, the, you know, the sensitivity that comes with the challenges that are uh, in being an immigrant or a refugee uh, person of color living in the US, so. Yeah, I'd like to add a small little point here. There was actually a study that the Kaiser Family Foundation put out. While there has been significant mistrust in you know, government and things like that, the, there's been a high percentage in parents that have actually have a higher trust in their pediatrician that, and, and getting sources, information about the pandemic and COVID and whether to get vaccinated or, or, or you know, strategies to take care of themselves. So 
you know, I'm advocating for Dr. Abdul Haq here. So, um, you know, if your par parents are coming back with concerns refer and, you know, they don't trust the CDC or the government or, you know, are they coming up with this misinformation about the virus, direct them to your pediatrician. They, you know, they see your kids, they know your kids. They also know your parents as well. So they're going to provide you with, you know, unbiased as much as possible information that, you know, can be utilized. So, you know, I know Dr. Heider said, have good relationships with the, you know, county health department, but also if there are pediatricians um, that are local to your schools, and if you need to bring them in to have a talk with your parent, with the parents, it just will build that confidence that the parents need to be able to send their children uh, confidently to, to school. Thank you so much. We've got a question here kind of related to what was discussed, um, what has just been discussed about contact tracing and quarantining if there's a positive case. Well, what happens if the classes are not closed or in other words, if the students are the migratory folks? So they're moving from classroom to classroom. You do see that often, especially with middle and high school um, students that they are moving from class to class. Let's say one of them has, um, a COVID positive case. So now what should the school be doing? Well, I can, I, I can give you an idea of what schools here in Central Ohio are doing. So what they have is an algorithm that is provided by the local health department again, and it lays out the different scenarios. Now, the question is, did the school require masking? Right. If the school did not require masking, then does the school know the vaccination status of the individual? Um, if the school did not require, does not know the vaccination status of the individual, then the algorithm says you need to be very, very careful and quarantine everybody. But if the, um, uh, let me qual qualify that, everybody meaning who was considered a close contact, right? So which is 15 minutes or more, um, in an uh, indoor environment um, within a certain distance, right? So that's where the local health department knows those definitions and they'll follow those. And so um, if here, for example, if, an un, if a masked student was considered a close contact of an unmasked student who uh, is COVID positive, then they do not quarantine the uh, student who had a mask on, right? And that is an encouragement that they're using to say, hey, if you put your mask on and you get exposed to or become a close contact of someone, you're not gonna miss out sports. You're not gonna miss out school events. You're not gonna miss out on school. So it's another way where superintendents are, at, are, are recommending uh, students to be masked um, when the board has, not recommend, not passed a, a mandate for masking because of political pressure or for other considerations. Um, but it's a very different scenario when both students are unmasked and one is considered uh, a close contact of a, of a COVID positive, and then both um, you know would be uh, asked to quarantine. That's that's in Central Ohio here, but you need to really consult with your local health departments. And if you go to their websites, they often have a K through 12 resource page where you can look at this information. If you don't want to, you know, for any reason, contact them in person, you can go to their websites. They'll have that information. They'll have those algorithms. And often they have weekly calls with the school nurses where superintendents can attend to ask these kinds of questions, get this kind of clarification. So if you're not part of the local school administration community, I would suggest that you try to reach out because I've been on weekly calls with the 20 superintendents across Central Ohio with the local health departments, you know, answering questions, doing the surveillance and they all really benefit because there's best practices going on that can be helpful as well, yeah. Speaking of best practices, we have a question that kind of, some of, some of which has been touched upon already, but maybe all of the panelists can address um, some aspect of this. So can you please touch on the COVID response plan and best practices for tracking, communication, and post-exposure care for the school? So we kind of hit some of that, um, 
but I guess this is, since it's such a broad question, it's a great opportunity for us to maybe recap some of those best practices. And I'll copy and paste this and put it in the main chat so you can also take a look at it as it is a mouthful. Um, so here we go. So touch on best practices for COVID response plan, tracking, communication, and post-exposure care. So um, for a COVID response plan, what has happened, uh, what's worked in some, indefinitely in, in, in the public school systems that I've mainly worked in is they have a COVID coordinator. So there's one person who's designated to do everything from sending out quarantine letters, uh, coordinating with local health departments, doing testing, doing quarantine, um, uh, doing other mitigation strategies, make sure, you know, communicating with the staff um, and the administrators and the board uh, and the parents on, on everything. So they've been mandated by the state here in Ohio to, to have that. And that's the person who develops the COVID response plan um, for what happens uh, uh, you know, when someone is exposed or, or someone is suspected of exposure and, and, and quarantine and, and actually implementing that and, and making sure that they're implementing it according to what the plan says and continuously updating that plan. So if you want examples of that, I would really suggest you look at the CDC guidance, which is very comprehensive and provides examples of such plans that you can then, um, uh, modify to fit your own um, um, circumstances. And that, again, also has great uh, information on tracking, uh, communication with parents. There's a, uh, a, a PDF that we're going to include in the resource guide that you'll get on how to communicate with parents about COVID-19 and vaccines uh, for school administrators specifically, um, and also post-exposure care. So I think we had a lot of principals saying, wow, that's what I do. <laughs> like, I would love to have right. a separate right. person, um, but I it's think that this is very much on the shoulders yes. of our Islamic school principals and, and leaders. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I would also say uh, along with that, um, you know, since schools are starting, it is possible that some families have been traveling within the U.S. for vacation or maybe overseas to visit family or relatives. They might be flying back. Um, we would strongly encourage um, the administrators to ask these uh, ask parents to make sure that they're you know the, the parents themselves, um, if they've been vaccinated, or if they're coming from a country where there's been a lot of um, uh, virus spread and transmission, that they get tested before coming to school. Because again, yeah. we want we it's that idea of we're keeping each other healthy. We want to make sure that we're trying to stop transmission as much as possible. And by use, utilizing this idea of let's stay healthy, how can we do that through testing, um, social distancing, things like that. So, and again, um, all the strategies that uh, Dr. Heider also mentioned in terms of once you've been able to identify that, yes, we do have an outbreak on our hands or, you know, we have, you know, cases on our hands, what, what to do. This is going to sound, and you guys can take it however you want, because I clearly I'm not an educator in the classroom, but do your schools have video cameras? I'm curious. The reason why I ask this is because I know that, but I see this all the time in the schools. They're like, well, I don't know who was sitting next to who and for when. And I'm always thinking to myself, like, I have these cameras in my office and I just go back and I look to see where people were, who came in when, who may have been exposed. And that's how I, you know, can tell a family like, oh, you may have been exposed to COVID because I have these cameras. So it may be completely unethical, but I feel like daycares do it. So schools should be able to do it. So I apologize if that information is incorrect. But if you do have them or if you have a way of kind of paying attention or, or kind of where children are sitting or where they are, that's going to help you a little bit with navigating, especially with these high schoolers and middle schoolers, if they're changing classrooms, like I don't know how the contact tracing is horrible. I'll be honest with that in my state for the high schoolers and middle schoolers. They don't know who you stood by in the hallways. They don't know, you know, they can't remember which day it was and all of these different things. And then people are notified they've already been at school for five, six days. <laughs> and you're like, all right, everybody just has COVID. 
So <laughs> I think it's really important to, 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 like I said, if you have that access, you're able to see hallways or things like that, or just simply making life a little bit easier on yourselves in which you don't allow everyone in the hallway for 15 minutes standing next to each mm. other, uh, eliminating that contact tracing. Right. And I think that's where having, you know, the importance of having indoor um, ventilation, having, you know, you're going to be running, you know, having air circulation as much as possible. I mean, the hallways are not going to, ha don't have windows. So the amount of ventilation there is going to be very limited, but that's where the HVAC system is going to come in, I mean, handy. So I would recommend that, you know, if schools have the budget and resources to invest in getting some, you know, very high efficiency uh, filtration systems. Mm -hmm. And I just got a comment from uh, brother Yakub, you know, saying that, you know, some families are traveling from overseas and they're kind of stranded there because of flight cancellations, um, because of COVID and they might be coming, you know, there might be a delayed attendance, you know, for more than a few weeks or, or so. So, with, I mean, with that, I would recommend like, you know, school administration, administrators find ways to provide, you know, whatever activities or education, you know, learning items that be prepared to have a package for those students who cannot come in because they, like, you know, Brother Yakub said, they're stranded overseas. And by the time they come back, they may have to quarantine themselves for two weeks or get tested, you know. So having those things yeah. will prevent students from being backlogged and fall behind in, in their education. So that once they're out of that quarantine phase, they're tested negative, they're healthy, they can come back to school and, you know, hopefully seamlessly transition back into class. Yeah. And for testing, I would add um, that there are a number of ways you can do that. I'm putting in the chat a link to testing that is being set up by the Department of uh, Health and Human Services across the Midwest. There are similar um, uh, coordination hubs that are offering uh, what's called pooled testing. And so um, what they'll do is that they will do everything for testing. They will ship you the test kits, they will pay for them, they will do the testing, they'll send you back the results. So it's a very cost-effective way uh, and they work specifically with schools and other congregate settings. Um, and so if you can take advantage of this for testing, this, this would be really helpful. In addition to that, certainly pediatricians offices have testing, but also states have allocations for testing and um, the, your school can request test kits to be sent where it's the antigen test kits where you, you can do the testing yourself. Um, but there's someone on the other side uh, who's approved um, to, to walk you through the steps. So testing is another strategy um, that can be really used well um, if you have a population that is uh, uh, you know, traveling uh, or coming back from traveling. I know in one school district, we recommended to them that um, for testing, what they do is that they, before going on spring break, for example, or coming back, they hand out these test kits to all the families to say, you know, just come by the school, pick up a test kit, get your kid tested. And if it's positive, keep them home. And if they're not, if they're test negative, then, you know, certainly uh, send them to school. So testing is a very critical um, strategy. And you, and you can get these for free often if you contact your local uh, health department. And Dr. Haider, well, we had a was, related sorry. question. Sorry, Dr. Abdul, go ahead. Oh, and I was just going to say, um, th those are great ideas and everything. And just make sure that you're asking for the results, like <laughs> to see the results. <laughs> Okay. And, and, and of course, then that's the legal question about can we require that or not. Um, so that would have to be addressed within each jurisdiction. Right. But relatedly, do, should, should they be asking parents and, and the legal issues aside, yeah. but should, from a health perspective, parents who were traveling with this children should also be tested and the results mm -hmm. be requested? Right. So if you go to this website, it actually gives you every single thing, the email templates that you need, the legal language that you can use um, in each of the different states, um, examples of consent forms for parents. So the Department of Health and Human Services has really taught this out and coordinated testing um, for across the U.S. in especially congregate care settings like schools. 
Um, so, so I would really take you, you know, uh, suggest that everybody, as much as possible, take advantage of this service that you may not know about, but they've really done all the homework for you. And then it's about, you know, you being able to implement it um, and, and they can certainly support you. And this is run by Battelle, by example, for example. So Battelle is a, you know, internationally known company. Coincidentally, they're based right here in Columbus, Ohio. So that's how I know about this. All right, thank you so much. We've got just three minutes to the hour, uh, to the top of the hour. You know, I know we've been talking a lot about physical health. Um, Dr. Abdul Haq also mentioned some elements of the, you know, just the impact, the emotional impact. And I was listening, re-listening to her um, discussion with uh, on the panel with Dr. Pochi as well. Uh, everyone needs a counselor right now. I just don't want to end this session without um, having at least someone from the panel speak a little bit about maybe Dr. Abdul Haq, especially as you are seeing um, children day in and day out as our students are re-entering. I could share with you my own um, heart throbbing stories about my own 13, 11, and four-year-old, but I'll, I'll give you the mic to speak just briefly about the importance of our children's um, psycho, um, social, emotional health. Well, you know, and if your school is able to, I recommend every school has a counselor on staff if they're able to, if not creating those resources in the community for children. Um, it's taken a huge toll on them as it has adults, and we often forget and don't realize that they also can suffer from anxiety and depression, just like adults. And so it'll make your um, teaching harder if we don't address those underlying issues. So I would definitely look into your area to make sure you have those resources for people you can refer children to or bring in virtually to speak to your students. You can make those contacts and ask a counselor if they're willing to partner with you all, uh, for especially those children who you feel just aren't giving 100% low performing, of course, speaking with their parents and everything like that, but create those things that oftentimes um, we just like to make dua and istakara and think our kids don't have issues. Um, but alhamdulillah, we have lots of Muslim uh, counselors as well, if you know, um, that can assist our children because it's very important that we address it as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Haq. I'm going to let Dr. Shafiq, uh, Brother Shafiq end with a reminder about something coming out very soon, inshallah. Yes. So inshallah, the um, National Muslim COVID Task Force has been working on putting a statement out um, with regards to reopening schools. So it will be kind of reminiscent of what we've things that we've discussed here. Um, it is not a comprehensive plan, but provides guidance as well as references that um, Dr. Heider uh, has mentioned as well. So it will be a, a very brief statement to kind of discuss um, opportunities and strategies towards reopening schools. So it, it will be brief, but it will allow for um, administrators to have references to, to go to, to um, see what sort of strategies are out there to help with the reopening process. So thank you. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you so much, Dr. Abdul Haq, Dr. Haider, Brother Shafiq, for joining us, um, the Islamic Schools League of America, and all of our colleagues at Islamic schools around the nation. Thank you so much to our Islamic school leaders who've joined us. I have posted in the chat also a flyer to an upcoming session with Dr. Fochi, um, organized by AMHP, American Muslim Health Professionals, as well as the Islamic Schools League of America is also a partnering organization um, promoting this. Inshallah, that will be on Monday, August 30th from 3 to 4 p.m. We're so excited to have had you all join us. We invite you to continue to ask us questions. You can email me at any time at info at theisla.org. And we are connected with these um, amazing individuals to be able to continue to facilitate and support you as you do the very important work that you do. I'll just conclude with Surat al-Asr. I'll actually ask Brother Nadir to um, conclude with Surat al-Asr and I'll hang around for just a little bit until we close. Thank you. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والأصل إن وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل بالحق والسواس وتواصل بالصبر صدق الله العظيم آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته
وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير thank you so much again دكتور دكتور هايدرين شكرا السلام عليكم السلام عليكم